Okay, so how do you do this, Richard? You don't have billions of dollars of satellite equipment and all this, but for years you've been saying there's water on Mars and there's water on Moon. How do you do this? We've been looking at evidence that there are ruins now left by someone, probably the ancestors of the human race, all over the solar system. And where you have ruins, you have water. Are, are they still going to use this probe in October where they were supposed to blast a massive hole or crater? What they're going to do in October, on October 9th, in the wee hours of October 9th, they're going to drop a, a spent upper rocket stage called a Centaur rocket, which has been you know developed for the last you know 40 years. Yeah. And they're going to drop this on the moon at, at impact velocities as one would come down from outer space pulled in by the moon's gravity, and when it hits, it will convert that kinetic energy of motion, of speed, of velocity, to basically a mini explosion. It's equivalent to about one car bomb in Baghdad. It's about one ton of TNT equivalent, and it will produce a really tiny crater. It'll be a crater about the size of a small house. It'll be maybe 15, 20 feet deep maybe 60, 70 feet wide. We're watching the remaining few seconds of uh, the LCROSS mission as we uh, approach very rapidly the surface of uh, the Cabeas Crater. Transition to DV mode. These are the Standby for shepherding spacecraft impact. The very last seconds of the uh, shepherding spacecraft trajectory as it approaches the lunar surface. We are seeing very small craters within the we, crater. We confirm a thermal signature of the crater. Our mid air cameras. Over. The uh, ground stations at Goldstone just reported Last a Last package, 11.35.05.054 seconds. The shepherding spacecraft has hit the surface of the moon, and this marks the end of the LCROSS uh, flight mission. Okay, some smiles and some congratulations right there. You can see some people watching that, uh, that uh, unprecedented experiment by NASA there, crashing two uh, pieces of equipment into the moon to try to find out if, in fact, there is frozen molecular water in the moon. Uh, and that's something that uh, NASA scientists were hoping to find out about that.
I'd like to talk about how the government has been mining on the moon for the past 40 years and how the public, Congress, and most everyone else have been kept out of the loop. How Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Space Lab, the shuttle, and the International Space Station are all cover for what's really going on. As a matter of fact, we first started sending men to the moon in 1962. We were going to Mars in 1966 and have traveled throughout the solar system since then. And tonight, I'm going to show you the photographs taken by NASA themselves that will show mining operations currently on, in operation. And these are not artifacts of ancient civilizations on the moon. This is going on here and now. And so I ordered some photos uh, from NASA of these uh, pictures of Copernicus. Here's the deal, Jordan. Here's how it got so interesting. Somebody sent me, and I'll never know who it was, a 16 by 20 negative of 162H, Lunar Orbiter 2, oblique photo of Com Copernicus, which had not been airbrushed at all. And what happened is uh, I had no way to print a 16 by 20 negative. So that thing sat in my garage for two or three years until the technology got to the point where I could go to Los, uh, go downtown mm -hmm. and get somebody to print it. When I did, it was spectacularly clear. Uh, I took it over to Bob Lazar's, and it was so big that he, he had to make four different scans of it, and we started looking at it, and it was just really interesting. And people started to contribute. Yeah, I see this, I see that. And uh, we just amassed all these things that were going on on Copernicus. It's obviously a mining operation. How, how do we know, John, if these mining operations are ours and not extraterrestrial events? Well, know. I'm sure they're part extra. We couldn't have possibly put that that massive a mining operation together in 40 years. I mean, we could no. have. I don't think we did. Somebody else is up there. Somebody else built all those buildings. There's no possible way we could have done that. Now, the reason I know that we're involved is several years ago, I ran into a real honest-to-gosh government insider. He's dead now, but he told me three things. And one was that we had been going to the moon since 1962. Uh, that the um, the that the population of Mars was 600 million, and they looked just just like us. And um, the other thing was that he had worked on a piece of mining equipment that was uh, to go to the moon. He said, John, he said we built this thing down in Alabama, way out in the nowhere. He said it was so enormous. He said when we finished the project, he said I actually rented a little airplane. He said I'm a private pilot and flew around this piece of equipment just to get an idea of how big it was. And I said, geez, that's fantastic. How, do you, how did they get it to the moon? Yeah. He said, I don't know. What are they mining for, John? That is a good question. Uh, what, we, what we think that they're mining for is uh, helium-3. And helium-3 would be uh, an excellent um, uh, power source if we can get uh, fusion together. That could power the planet for years. Yes. So old Gary McKinnon decides to hack into some uh, government websites and uh, computers. He's looking for information about UFOs and extraterrestrials, and this guy could get 80 years. But what do you think this guy was really hacking into? He was just seeing what he could find, and what he found was a list of the secret astronaut corps. The secret astronaut corps was formed at the same time that the public astronaut corps was, was, uh, was formed. Uh, but the secret ast astronaut corps were the ones that were going to the moon in 1962, you know, and here we were just making suborbital flights and then finally an orbital flight. 